Do we have any questions? Yes. I, I, I would ask any of the um, speakers, where do you start? I, I taught in public school freshmen, and virtually every, in the city of Boston, 95% African American kids coming into my classroom. Every child coming in knew that Thomas Jefferson had fought, knew that Thomas Jefferson had fathered children with Sally Hemings. Most of them did not, most of them did not know uh, the founding documents or what Thomas Jefferson had written. And, and so we started, you know, with civic education. Uh, but, but where do you start? You, you've described it, and you're dealing at the college level. I dealt for 30 years at the high school level. Um, but where do you start? Where do we start as a society now? Um, I'll, I'll jump in here. Uh, I, I think you. I, th I think you have to start with uh, sending your kindergarten kids to the lobbies of luxurious hotels. <laughs> <laughs> it's now my grandchildren. <laughs> your grandchildren, yeah. Um, you know, actually, the funny thing is that uh, Jane Addams, the Canadian sociologist and uh, critic of urban planning, suggests almost the same sort of thing that Father Rutler suggested, that it's a, a really thriving uh, urban culture will involve children crawling all over the place um, and not cordoned off into, into playgrounds, which then quickly become hotbeds of crime. Um, you just have them everywhere, and if you think that uh, if, if, if you were a criminal and you were aware that the, there was these fearless children, uh, especially boys crawling everywhere and getting into all kinds of tight places, uh, whose eyes can be on you, well, it's a great deterrent, um, actually, from crime. Um, the thing is that y you have to... Uh, it's, it's, by the time they're freshmen in high school, we're, we're now dealing with um, badly wounded people on the battlefield. We're dealing with conversion, not yeah. education. We have yeah. to undo what's Yeah, you have to undo what's I, I face the same problem at, at, with, with my freshmen. Um, and the, the immediate necessity is to put something beautiful in front of them and to show them that it's a legitimate object of their love and wonder. Um, to sort of crack open the preoccupations that, they've been, that, that have been instilled in them from uh, 12 years of... of bad education. Um, but if you don't have that problem, that is, you're dealing with a very young person, then, my gosh, there's this whole natural world out there, and there are, there are great, great books. Now, the, the thousand good books, the list that John Sr. came up with many years ago, uh, is a great start. You should be reading The Wind in the Willows, and, um, and Stuart Little, and uh, The Secret Garden, and fairy tales and poems, especially. Well, it, it, it's, this, is, this is certainly an example of uh, well, what my wife and I call different world alert or different universe alert. Um, I read somewhere, it might have been in Century Magazine, which I collect, that on his 70th or 75th birthday, uh, the, some, uh, a whole big group of schoolboys in Boston, in Cambridge, came to visit uh, Longfellow at his house to, um, on their own, on their own initiative, to, to celebrate birthday with him and to thank him for all the poems that he'd written that they loved so much. And so he had tea and um, scones with, with the boys in his living room. Uh, that, it's almost unthinkable now, but you think it, it, at, at that time, right, there was already for young people an education in, in the free making arts, right? Um, basically, start very young, and uh, it, whatever you see the schools doing, just go and do the opposite. And, uh, it, you'll be right 19 out of 20 times anyway. Um, well, uh, I thought I'd ask a question to sort of a bare bones question. Setting aside hotel lobbies, which may be a solution of almost everything we've been talking about right now, we're celebrating Catholic education, and what we're particularly concerned with is the products that come out of the primary and secondary world, because you were all uh, 
writers and college professors. In what way should a Catholic education on that level, in, in the most bare bones way, distinguish itself from, say, the public system? Now, how should that be different so that that, that world, that Catholic education world, distinguishes itself and maybe helps to uh, move society in some way? Except for me. <laughs> Any of you? Any? Again, I quoted, aside, we'll tell well, no, I, I quoted that man before who said that he was a Presbyterian and a Freemason, but uh, he had to admit that Catholics gave us civilization. And we have to take that position, affirm that, and not be defensive. Uh, we've got the upper hand. Now, he, he, uh, he acknowledged that. I think we've, the, uh, the, uh, the Catholic educators have been too defensive. We have to argue from a, period, a position of superiority. I don't mean egoistically, but just objectively. Um, and also, we must not be intimidated by the worldly cult of, of youth. Um, very helpful. I had an old professor who said that he was very popular with his students because he held them in contempt. <laughs> <laughs> they were impressed with that because they, they had never been treated like that before. It's significant that these this phenomenon now of the students rioting and like they're called snowflakes. Because snowflakes disappear very quickly. But as far as it, it, uh, my parish is in the part of Manhattan called Hell's Kitchen, which gives you some idea of what it, what it was like. Changing rapidly now, it's the biggest real estate development in the history of the country. Eight skyscrapers going up in my, my parish. It's a, it's a kind of nexus of mankind in many ways. The other night, election night, the Democrat Party, the, the, their uh, election night, well, I guess they called it a party at the start of the evening. That was at the Janet Center, which is a five minute walk to uh, the west of my church. Mrs. Clinton's uh, concession speech was at the Hotel New Yorker, which is a five minute walk to the north, <laughs> to, to the east of my church. So we're right in the middle of things. But I have found in the church, basically, if you don't talk down to people, if you just explain to them the cultural tradition of the faith and speak logically, they understand. It. My, most of my parish, well, I have a very diverse kind of congregation. Some very, very intellectual people. Most people are in, in Hell's Kitchen. But the only people who've ever intimated to me that I was talking over the heads of the people were professors. <laughs> Normal people understand basic things. They're very, uh, very sensible uh, that way. And I have never been a professor. I've had a lot of professors, but I've never been a professor. And I tell my, my friends who teach that it would have been very nice if I had been able to teach in a university, but teaching in a university is like uh, fishing in an aquarium. Uh, but uh, 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 teaching in a parish is like deep sea fishing. <laughs> uh, and there's a great advantage to being in a situation now in our culture when people are largely bereft of information because everything is new, new to them. I have these young fellows that are right out of business school and the like, and they come over and we watch these old films. They have fallen in love with Myrna Loy. <laughs> I told them, uh, one night we had over the uh, Mr. Martin Scorsese, the director, uh, I told him I stopped watching films when uh, Greg Garson died. And he said, he thought that was a very good standard. But it was fascinating seeing these young people, their reaction to the films. They had never seen women speak so nicely, dress so nicely, be so clever. Uh, these are far more impressive than some of these wild-eyed feminists today. One problem, though, I've noticed. 
is that when I try to show them a sort of, an, say, an Agatha Christie film, for instance, they have a very hard time following the train of thought, the plot. It is a very short attention span. So that that has to be uh, that has to be addressed. I don't know that that's well uh, directly that in response. The first thing that parochial school students should know is that despite going to that school, they're sort of visiting an outpost of civilization. And if they get that into their heads, then they will understand the importance and the difference of their education from the rest of the world. Well, Can I address the same question on these days? Yes, of course. So an outpost of civilization. Um, I like the expression that is used at Georgetown, the whole person. Person rather than self. We're already changing the changing the terms of the discussion. Person implies uh, personalism. The nature of the encounter is person to person. That's what the incarnation means. God uh, became man to suggest that the proper scale of things is the human scale, personal scale. The whole person. I think uh, Catholicism, Catholic education can help us keep in mind that some kind of wholeness is the goal of the human life. We're not whole, we're broken, uh, we're incomplete, uh, we're made whole um, in the course of our lives, if all goes well, uh, through the cooperation of others, but that, that the goal is a kind of wholeness, uh, and that we don't fashion ourselves, but we begin um, with the person, the person we are, and we have to uh, go from there. Uh, if we can communicate that, <clears throat> One more question. Good morning. Uh, <laughs> microphone's scary. Uh, I have a question that may be deceptively easy, but it's it's why I came here, so I'm going to ask it. What do you see in Catholic education that gives you hope? I, I say this knowing that we we're talking about the dwindling numbers of schools and and some of these other problems that Catholic education is facing. Uh, you know, recently in, in Hudson, a, a town next door to mine, they closed the school and turned it into a parking lot. I, um, I get invitations now in the last couple of years uh, pretty regularly from groups who are either uh, representatives of public school consortia uh, charter schools that have returned as much as a public school can return these days to uh, what what is called a classical education basically it's an old-fashioned liberal arts education excuse me eating a mint but um, in the public schools without uh, with, with a kind of nervousness about talking about the ultimate things right so that they can read Paradise Lost, just so long as they don't take it terribly seriously. <laughs> um, and these schools are growing, right? But then there's, there, there's another group of schools, um, Chris, classical Christian schools. And um, because of the culture wars, uh, Catholics and evangelical Christians of a kind of orthodox or small c Catholic event, have come together in all kinds of enterprises, homeschooling, um, the pro-life movement, and now in the class, classical Christian schools. Um, I was in Oklahoma City a couple of years ago, and um, I was supposed to give a talk to parents and uh, well-wishers and older students, this thing that, is, that was a, 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 originally three separate schools, now one big school with at that time 455 students. It had grown from almost nothing to 455 in a few short years. Uh, Hobby Lobby was do donating to them some prime real estate. Uh, they, they're going great guns. Um, so I was, I just had just arrived. They took me to dinner before my talk. And sure enough, there we were in the, the restaurant and parents who send their 
daughter, their seven-year-old daughter, to that school were sitting right over there. They made the daughter come over to me and recite for me the 60 lines of Dante's Inferno that she had memorized. <laughs> Um, from, of course, my translation, and in typical seven or eight year old girl, she was in second grade, um, in eight, eight year old girl fashion, she did ramrod the, the translation right through. Um, it is remarkable, and Catholic schools, I see, have um, some Catholic schools that have been well established, that is, there's Catholic schools of long standing. Some of them have returned to this sort of education. Um, and I say, I say it's classical, but we would scare quotes around that because we are not necessarily talking about requiring students to learn Latin, uh, although Latin is usually offered at such places, much less uh, Greek. J Jefferson said about uh, teaching kids Greek that it was probably too hard for them when they were seven or eight years old, but to wait until around 12 or 13 um, to teach Latin first. <laughs> that, that's another different universe alert. Uh, those schools are experiencing big spikes in enrollment. Um, there are new, new schools just recently started up on, on the uh, classical model. They're, they're succeeding. They're not dying. Um, and try to get that message through to Catholic educators at all levels is, that, that is somehow still difficult, possibly because the teachers and administrators have not grown up with that education. So they'd be deeply uncomfortable with, uh, say, for instance, saying that you know all of our kids ought to be learning and memorizing great English poetry when they're very young, because they themselves have not done that um, and would find it actually foreign and even kind of threatening. But the, there, there is that out there. It's, it's homeschoolers know this too, and so th I think there are plenty of opportunities for Catholic schools to bolster their enrollment by sticking that tag, classical, onto the description of their, their educational mission, and then taking initial steps towards making that something of a reality. But that, I think, is a very hopeful sign. Well, I might just add about hope. <coughs> you said that um, a, uh, a pessimist is an unhappy idiot. And an optimist is a happy idiot. There's <laughs> a difference between optimism and hope. Optimism is wishing things will come true. Hope is knowing things will come to pass, the good things will happen, if we cooperate with the Lord. Now, in my Archdiocese of New York, the school system is in a very bad way. The uh, Common Core curriculum was imposed on all the schools without any consultation parents, pastors, or anything else. We have, at the same time, new private Catholic academies being formed, and they are extremely uh, uh, popular. There is a sense that as long as we uh, don't uh, homogenize our identity, if we have an honest brand, people will turn to it. Now, the paper of record in my city, or former record, the New York Times, on Friday apologized for being wrong. They didn't exactly put it that way. The New York Times is never wrong. But they said they failed to be right. <laughs> I interpreted it the same way. But significantly, they said they had misjudged the pulse of the people. And that has gone on in our schools, colleges, universities. There, we're going through a shock treatment now in our culture. And many people are going to say, you know, it's time to call the emperor naked. We've made some mistakes. Some people will take it very hard. Other people will learn from it. I would suggest that if we really want a, a blueprint as to what we should be doing now, just read Newman's idea of a university. Uh, he was so prophetic. And he was dealing, when he was trying to start a, a university in Dublin, he was dealing with bishops who were totally obtuse. They were putting every stumbling block in his way. They only had a small idea of the Catholic education. 
And he said, no, he says, you're trying to get a seminary here. I'm making a university. And he says, uh, a university is not the seminary. And if you don't understand that, eventually the schools will turn on the church. I just have this one sentence here I neglected to uh, read. My, my grandmother was my first teacher. And she was on the English side of my family. She, I don't think she went beyond fifth grade. Girls didn't. She was tutored at home. <coughs> she was extremely literate. It's where I, the professor mentioned Tennyson. I learned a lot of Tennyson. My grandmother was born when Gladstone was prime minister. <laughs> and uh, uh, I, I thought Gladstone was still alive when I was a child. <laughs> <laughs> but when she came to this country, she became very political. And I remember one day coming home and telling my grandmother, who adored Teddy Roosevelt, that the teacher said Roosevelt's name was Franklin. So then she broke the news to me. It was a bad one as well as a good one. <laughs> <laughs> I grew up. But uh, the, my grandpa belonged to the 45th Cheshire Regiment uh, in, in England. And that regiment uh, had been, uh, her, her, her two brothers had been killed in the First World War, the Yves Salient, that was common. The regiment, four bears had been in the Crimean War, the Boer War, the Crimean War, uh, had, at Waterloo, and they came here in the Revolution. I get very nostalgic when I come to Boston because I think perhaps my slight possibility that my great, 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 great grandfather shot the man who fired the shot heard around the world. <laughs> 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 History was living. See, it was a living, living tradition. Kids today, when they listen to music, they've never heard of Frank Sinatra. I've had experience. College students have never heard of Frank Sinatra. I grew Jimmy up with John McCormick and uh, Harry Lauder and all these early records. Uh, Madame Schumann Heinck on those early records. It was part of our vocabulary. But anyway, let me end by saying that reading this line, which I think is chilling in its uh, uh, prophetic nature. This is in Newman's idea of university. Uh, intellectualism first and chiefly comes into collision with precept and with doctrine and then with the very principle of dogmatism. A perception of the beautiful becomes the substitute for faith even within the pale of the church. And with the most unqualified profession of her created acts, if left to itself, as an element of corruption and infidelity. If a university is captive to itself, apart from the sacred uh, faith, such corruption will become a religion of its own, and the university will become an institutional rival uh, to the church. <coughs> Pretty prophetic, I think. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you all very, very much. <laughs>